What's up, guys? With Shrimp Po' Boy coming at you. Now, if you're if you're if you're gonna use a diesel engine and you don't want a mandated DPF or DEF on it, have fun having trouble with the law, the the so-called law. Have fun with that. You will get fucked with. And they will quote unquote justify your attacking your rights. The piece of shit. <laughs> but you're making a choice where you have to tangle with them. You're going to tangle with them inevitably. Unless you're using an older model diesel engine where you can get an emissions waiver. Like an engine that still worked in the 80s and 70s and stuff like that, you can get emissions waivers for because it now it's becoming a collector's. They're becoming collector items with aftermarkets and restorative and overhaul centered mark aftermarkets around them now, just like a lot of older engines because these do have workhorse capabilities and potentials to this day, and they're still badass and they and they can take hits. They're very they can be very made very reliable if you fucking take care of them. You know, and that nice MPG is a nice little factor. So, them fucking diesel, tier, them little, them fucking turbo, you know, two stroker swap outs and trucks gives them a much higher miles per gallon, even though they scream. Although you can fix that by using an inertial storage hydraulic transmission if you desire. You absolutely can do that. So, There it is. I found it. <laughs> and another one. Pardon that. <laughs> okay, then. Done. So, you will get in trouble with fat asses and the EPA and all them so called environmentalists. You get in trouble with them. They unfortunately have legal power and they will fuck with your ass in more ways than you want to imagine if, you, if you're going to do this in the modern diesel. But if my talking, if I didn't talk you out of it and you're still going to do that, please listen to these type of mods that allow more mileage and to some degree, to some degree, cleaner running, cleaner burning. Okay? I warned you. And if you're still going to do it, look at these to minimize your impact from that. Okay. All right. Number one, preheating the fuel to 104 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. For those of you who use Celsius, that would mean 40 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius max. Using the coolant line coming out of the engine, going to the radiator. Cut a section out, put some aluminum tubing if you want. It does work. It does work. It will give you more mileage. And if you're using diesel in certain applications, the ignition delay shortened and you can lower NOx to certain parts, number of parts per million in NOx coming out to the exact exhaust, excuse me, the exhaust manifold. So there is a tr there is a perk to doing it. So there there is a, there's a, there's an art to it. And if you're using biodiesel to increase lubricity and give add a little lot, just a little bit of oxygen to the whole thing, and and if it's sulfur free, that's even better. This is this becomes even better. Anywhere from B1 to B20, th this effect can happen even better. So again, it just, it's nice. Now the NOx, depending on the position of the nozzle being a little higher or a little lower than default, than the default, and whatever the sweet spot from lowering NOx to losing power and all the other forms of pollution skyrocketing and leading into more problems in the engine versus it's what it's default, whatever the sweet spot between the default and that and getting that too high to lower NOx, that will ver that will affect the uh, NOx dropping of preheating, or it might make it go up. But but just using plain diesel fuel or ultra low sulfur diesel, it might drop the NOx because of the faster and better combustion. It can. It has been shown. I've shown that on the my video re reacting responding to Scotty Kilmer's diesel uh, engine video. So I know what I'm talking about. 
I've changed oil filters. I've I've helped bleed injectors. I've helped I've helped fucking you know I help with that that kind of shit. I've worked on diesels a couple times, especially tractors. Tractors are a bit easier for me, from my opinion. Diesels are diesels and trucks to me are a bit more of a pain in the ass. But that's my take on it. You can argue and disagree if you want. That's fine. That's your experience. Type it down below if you disagree. Keep it simple. Don't go fucking Tismo, Supremo's, chot man child on my ass, or I will fucking <laughs> I'll fucking have a field that I'll fucking go after you. <laughs> I'll go after I'll fucking reply and we're gonna have a fucking hit we're gonna have keyboard fighting. <laughs> we're gonna be civil or you gonna fucking you're gonna get your own shit thrown back at you times ten. I'll be a real asshole. <sighs> but yes, it can vary. Some of those things can factor in how that can be affected, but most of the time it will drop most all emissions, including NOx, a little bit. Two, getting the air intake, whether you, if you, if say if you're, if you're a turbo diesel user, go, the air intake tubing going to the turbo, thermally insulated from the any external source of heat as much so it'll be as cool as possible. There are products by Heat Shield, the Heat Shield company that'll do this, and then thermal wrapping around that will also help do this. Three, keep your fucking EGR and keep it the way it's going. That'll lower NOx. Paired with higher density of oxygen. It, work, it helps even more. Uh, four. Insulating your exhaust pipes going to the joining, the, you know, you know if you, you're, you're, the piping section of piping coming out your manifold before they converge and then feed into a turbo or feed into two turbos. Like, say, if you're a sequential turbo user. Use the small one at idle, and then the big one kicks on, and you got one or two cylinders, depending on how many cylinders your engine is. You spin in the small one, and then you got the big one always pulling air in too. You got both pulling air in. You could have two gates where the little one still runs, but it feeds air into the part, uh, part some some degree of air into the big one. And then the big one can draw air from the environment and the compressed air. And from the little turbo and compress it f further. And, if, and it'll, it'll pull it in. There are certain ratios and size differences you got to be exact about to do that little trick I just told you, I just to show, talked about just now. But it can be done. You can pull the air in the small turbo in as well as air from the environment you got certain ratios you got to sizes differences you got to be careful with but you can do it uh, making the air intake around the air filter bottom of the air filter more open bottom of the air intake box or whatever or just around the filter in general more open and more able to flow as long as air, said air goes through the filter only and so you got some screening and mesh and grading together, like and so it's, a, it's like rocks and pebbles and little and little step bits of stuff can't get past the bottom. It can be bounced out, out off, back onto the road. A piece of gravel can be caught by it and it'll bounce off it back onto the road, kind of thing, to minimize anything going into the air intake and destroying your engine from within. You can do this. Check out budget boosting and max boosting channels for that down below, and then see why I advocate that little addition in the engine bay around the air intake if you're going to do something like that for safety's sake and keeping your engine running. <sighs> Number six, giving the tur either giving the turbo its own reservoir and in little pressure a pump to give it most lubrication as possible. That'll keep going and pumping oil to cool the bushings down until it's done. Or mentioned in George Wiseman's um, Super Gas Saver Secrets book, um, an independent oil pressurizer system drawing off the engine crankcase. 
to so it'll build up oil pressure in the engine before it allows the engine to start and, and up to the turbo if you route through the, some of the pressure up through there I'll make sure it's running before it even starts up so you have oil in the engine and at the turbo ready to go at the start which if you which if you have don't have, have none like in most cases this causes the, the most engine wear idle will cause the most engine and turbo bushing wear hands down this will completely rem remove the vast majority of that it's not going to get rid of it completely but it'll drastically cut it down and extend the engine life of the turbo shaft turbocharger and um, the engine life as well and, and if, the, if they're built if it's built right it'll also maintain oil pressure for the engine and the turbo after the engine is shut off and it'll help with that so that really helps the turbo last longer and it'll shut off once it, it shuts off based on the temperature sensor it will shut the circuit switch and to turn shut it off completely shut it off once it once things are cooled down enough gotta be sure about that feature seven replace your cooling fans with racing fans or flex fans uh, will allow more cooling to be done on the same power if the material is light enough the design is designed with good blades can pull more air at idle reduce engine drag at, at higher speeds for the fans and so whatnot is and do all that if you know what you're doing you can get that done and it'll be done at and it can allow better power and mileage or you can use an electric fucking radiator fan that works at certain temperatures that'll also do too but you, why don't you try the mechanic this route first then try then use that as a last result Re last resort I mean <sighs> number eight Scotty Kilmer said this before and I'll sh and it showed well when you use radiators that are all metal and have more rows the radiators built like this will cool your engine better and last a lot longer now number nine on older engines that don't have colder air intakes you can make them make sure the air intake is further away from the engine itself in the engine bay and it's heat wrapped shield for heat shield and then thermal wrap around that to block as much heat from saturating in the intake tube as possible where it even will minimize the coolness uh, minimize the heating saturation of the intake after you shut the engine off just just thought I'd put that out there and and make when you if you do this and you do make it you make sure that the starts out as wide as possible and then narrows down to fit either a turbo or two turbos or whatever you're doing at or, or, or the default manifold intake manifold now on Detroit the intake manifold to a roots blower that way you'll have density and speed or velocity you want both and you want as much of both as possible most modern vehicles are already cold air intakes so make sure you just thermally shield wrap the uh, thermally and you know reflective shield you know and thermal wrap the fucking uh, intake going to a turbo or whatever the fuck and then make sure you, you uh, have a certain amount of heat shield thermal shielding around the intake tube going to the manifold a few certain number of inches away from the um, starting a few inches away from the output of the intercooler that'll do you good because the intercooler will con con condense air after it's been compressed by the air blower side of a turbocharger or two if you're using sequential or twin turboing or more if you really want to go crazy with it which means more fuel could be used or preheated fuel can be used to make more of a bang as preheated fuel can expand into air charge more easily and burn much better Ooh. Another thing you can do is adjust the actual ejection pressure and timing for, for um, diesels. 
Last I th looked into it was around 200 bar, 210 bar for each injector on a direct injection, and I think it was like 150, 270 bar, 75 bar for indirect injection, somewhere in that range. I could be, I could be misquoting the sources of mine a little bit, but that's off of memory. And you could raise the resting positions of the nozzles as you do this a little bit until you lose power and make again carbon cause more engine wear and make all the other kinds of smoke pollution skyrocket I mentioned this already but this is something you could do so adjusting the injection pressure timing and resting positions of the nozzles so you can cut knocks down without trading off excess too much power and that way you can make up for it with these other mods used with that 11. You get yourself a dual fuel conversion if you want. Whether, whether either run it on, with a plasma assisted fuel, on, you know, an onboard fuel reformer of sorts, run it on CNG or LNG or LPG fuel gases. So you could take advantage of the lower smoke, better power, and if you use CNG or LPG, you could plumb the choice of gas to a pressure regulator, mechanic like piston one, like compressed air supercharger cells, for an example of that. That could be mounted next to a radiator and intercoolers. And the low pressure gas can be used to cool the intercooler and make the air more dense before your CNG or LPG, your, your, your final output natural gas or LPG gas gets mixed with intake air. It'll be cooler and denser before that mixes with it and then actually makes the air denser so it'll be able to compress and do real well and you only need enough diesel to actually ignite the stuff and make take advantage of that because uh, the right ratio of natural gas to diesel and whatnot the electronic controls you can do nowadays is absolutely fucking phenomenal for both and uh, oh yeah it's it's beautiful dude and pair it with the fuel preheating and shit it's top top notch makes it all the better all the other stuff and number, number 12 if you do not consider the dual fuel setup of number of uh, which is option 11 consider using the Heiko 2DT system that's been third party tested by in owners of Cummins and Cater I'm sorry Perkins and Caterpillar engines back in the 1993 I showed that reference on my Scotty Kilmer video about diesel engines I showed that for you to see I'm not just going to read off of these notes since I'm only glancing at it to keep myself on track, but yeah, now I'm going to just go ahead and read this and just be bluntly honest with you. Basically, it's a canister to be, that can be installed to the fuel return line of a diesel engine or not. If not, if you choose a different fuel for instead, you could do, that uses pressurized gas, say a small amount of pressurized air and a little bit of fuel to draw a thin film of fuel to coat a hovering up and down ball inside the said canister to make it finally dispersed. Um, Make it, it, it could form a finely dispersed spray of five micron small sized droplets. A single, um, a second. Let me give you a reference to how small, uh. Oh! Uh, let's see if you can see this or not. Or not. Well, I can't know if you can see it or not, but, uh, strand of hair is dangling. Five microns is smaller than this, quite a bit. Real high performance biodiesel filters around or operate at five microns, and that's smaller than this. Way, it makes that look big. It makes that look like a tree trunk almost. That's tiny. Five microns is tiny. Then those droplets are drawn through the top of the can into the intake pipe and going to the turbocharger. That's why it's called 2DT for diesel turbo. Then the turbo vaporizes the droplets into the air which turns into an extremely lean vapor mixture that condenses the air a little bit. Taking a little bit of heat out of the intake charges, this little bit of vapor forms which helps the intercooler more and as a result cooler dense air with an extremely lean amount of fuel vapor dispersed as a homogeneous charge half ass in the principle of a homogeneous charge compressed ignition. I said half ass it, with emphasis on that part. It uh, Making a homogeneous charge, it will wait, be way too lean to knock under compression. It won't be able to bust off before it, and, and 
knock in diesel. No. But it'll help the diesel or biodiesel ignite quicker and make the detonation triggered flame front, instead of being forming around the nozzles, instead it'll form all throughout the combustion chamber immediately instead of just around that nozzle and this helps the fuel burn better make the lag, the lag, the lag time and ignition of diesel sh even shorter than before smoother burning a little bit more power and due to the quicker and better combustion smoother but burn, bur burning as well will lead to less exhaust temps greatly reduce smoke pollution and less fuel consumption overall and if you Combine the power gains uh, in, in with being a feather foot with your gas pedal, you can turn that into the horsepower power increase into more mileage. Beautiful, isn't it? Now, the way the automotive technician George Wiseman invented this Heiko system, he invented it to not work any draw, not work on any more uh, air pressure than 30 psi feeding into the canister. So. You can make it work like that. Only, only draw through that little line, that hosing, feeding into it. Only draw at max 30 psi, and then run as much boost as you want afterwards in a diesel engine. You just have to know. You just need to get the Heiko 2DT manual. Supplemental material is ideal too if you want to, you know. And then get the double mileage guaranteed. But look at the coupon code, the uh, DMG Part One, capital letters DMG, lowercase letters P A R T, and then the number one as the coupon code. Get it completely for nothing because he offers it like that, and then that's how you get it. And so you'll know more about mileage and stuff and whatnot. Um, like, like the medium and speed engines like Detroit Diesel would benefit from the uh, Heiko 2DT mod so damn much it's unreal. The last thing you need to do is pick, get a MAP or MAF sensor enhancer circuit. If you use a mass airflow or mass manifold air pressure sensor, they both are similar. They can be swapped in for one another. The sensor enhancer can work on both because of their similarities. Or if, say if you got an engine that's got both, you need to dyno test which which sensor needs the will work best with the enhancer circuit put to it. Then get electronic fuel injection enhancers for the for the all for every oxygen sensor in the exhaust system. Because what's going to happen is this is the opposite of the cheat device. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it to emphasize it, because if you don't like it too bad, go cry more. You're going to have... You're going to send... You're going to have more oxygen freed up because better combustion and a little bit quicker. So what's going to happen is that, that higher amount of oxygen in the tailpipe is going to give a false, oh, fuck, we're running too lean signal to the computer. And it's going to, the computer's going to signal the injectors to throw more fuel in. Now, if you're mechanically operated, don't fucking worry about it. <laughs> Just mechanical fuel injection, don't worry about it. Just don't even worry about it because you don't need it at that point. <laughs> um, I would suggest the air sensor enhancer circuit or whatever the fuck you're going to do. Um, if you think you know what you're doing, you know how to get the best electronic parts and all that and use electronic injection timing it's in, instead of being purely mechanical and you know how to do it, you know how to make that happen something like a Detroit or whatever you go right ahead and be my guest but anyway this is something that can just make your uh, Detroit diesel if you got one in a truck have that much better mileage you can run you can run ethanol through this uh, Heiko system and give that ethanol vapor a try that way and paired with intercooling and proper turbocharging and that will be the end of the video sorry for the sudden jump cut someone was starting to open the damn door and it wouldn't matter if I told them ahead of time I was gonna record the individuals in question would do it anyway so that's that see you later again all the references down below